Without further ado, we'll move on to our second speaker today. And again, very pleased to introduce in this case, uh, Dr. Alex Henderson from the University of Manchester. And Alex is gonna give us a slightly more tutorially based presentation, I think today, uh, on getting started with chemometric characterize or chemometric classification, sorry. So if I just sort out control, I'll hand over control to you, Alex, and it should be over to you now. Okay, thank you very much. Let me just uh, grab the correct screen. Can you see the presentation now? Yep, that's come up. That's Fantastic. good. All yours. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Ben and Joe and the uh, Molecular Spectroscopy Group for giving me the opportunity to come here and talk about uh, well, to actually go nowhere, to sit in my back bedroom <laughs> and, to, uh, and to talk about um, data analysis. And um, when, we first, when we first proposed this, um, this presentation, the, the idea was to talk about uh, a tutorial sort of uh, view on um, of classification, chemometrics for classification. And as I was putting the, uh, the, the slides together, I realized that actually to start from, uh, from zero and get up to classification is actually quite a, a challenge in uh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, it's, uh, it's whole careers work for some people, it's whole um, department work for some universities. And so uh, I'm starting with uh, a particular topic which is uh, very, very commonly encountered in data analysis, multivariate data analysis, and that's principal components analysis. And, uh, and hopefully that um, the idea here would be to take it through in, a, in a baby steps, as it were, covering some pre-processing steps, and then what uh, principal components analysis is, and how you interpret it, and then some of the, the things that you should take into account as you're, um, uh, as you're doing an analysis. So, uh, so I'm Alex. I'm in Manchester. Uh, I'm also involved with the uh, International Society of Clinical Spectroscopy, um, director of that, and the director of surface spectra. Uh, surface spectra are um, in uh, secondary and mass spectrometry rather than spectroscopy. Um, we've got a website which uh, on which I will put these slides. These slides are, are um, putting under. Uh, Creative Commons um, use, so you means you can download, you can reuse these uh, slides as you wish, and um, and I'll put them up there probably later on today. So first of all, I'd like to, to give you some resources and, and background because I think that's a good place to start. Um, so the, the data I'm showing here is from Roy Goodacre. This is um, uh, some data that's downloadable from his website, and. Um, and this, I guess, is an example of data reuse and data sharing. And uh, there's, a, there's a big push towards doing that at the moment. And this is this is an example of that. It's often difficult to identify examples. Uh, for discussion purposes, uh, we, uh, as, as part of ClearSpec, the International Society for Clinical Spectroscopy, we have a, a, a data space um, for a discussion of any type of data analysis. It, it has a slant towards clinical work and certainly um, infrared and Raman spectroscopy but uh, non-clinical uh, work would also be interesting for discussion there. Um, and uh, for data sharing, uh, we have um, a, a space on the Zenodo data repository, which will hold data sets up to 50 gigabytes or more. Uh, it's free, and, and that's a good place to look for uh, data if you need something for, um, to put together a presentation, for example. Uh, this is just a list, uh, it's, it's certainly not a complete list, of data analysis software. Um, most of that is free and open source, uh, covering lots of different platforms, MATLAB and um, R, Python, for example, some Java. So there's probably something there that you can you can begin to get your teeth into. Uh, I'm uh, putting a, a shameless plug here for uh, my toolbox, which is in MATLAB, um, and uh, that's downloadable from this site. Um, as I said, uh, I'm sharing these slides later, but I believe that you have the option to just click on a, a a screen capture. So if you wanted to do that, then you can you get all those links now to, uh, to go away and, and um, search. So data analysis, where, where do we sit in data analysis? So chemometrics is kind of the measurement of chemistry, and that falls into two broad categories of so, uh, univariate uh, statistics uh, and multivariate statistics. So univariate um, is where we measure a single parameter of something. 
So we might measure, for example, uh, viscosity. And that would be, we, we take a single measurement, we might have many samples, but there's only one thing we're measuring. Those give us distributions, and then there's a long history of statistics with distributions, um, some of which are examples there of, uh, for example, the student's t-test, ANOVA, uh, many others there. Multivariate analysis is, is the area that we're in, really, because we're in spectroscopy, and, and that means that we're measuring many things, many parameters of a sample at the same time. So we have lots more information. And some things, we're, we're comparing two, uh, two different samples, for example, some spectral features may go up while others go down. So it's quite difficult to, to identify directly what any, uh, any correlation in the data. So there are, there are techniques for managing this in statistics. Um, they're broadly, these days, classified into two areas. There's hypothesis-driven work, which is your classical statistics. And that's all based on the idea of a central limit theorem, normal distributions. And because it's based on those, then there are calculations that can be performed on that, um, are idealized perhaps in a, a sense of a normal distribution. But it gives us a starting point for our data analysis. The, um, the more um, recent advances in this are in machine learning. These don't have these, uh, these underlying distribution um, uh, parameters that are, that are present in the hypothesis driven work. Here we start from the data and we try to, um, to calculate or work out what the distribution might be, if there is a distribution at all, and certainly what trends there might be. In both of these areas, we have unsupervised uh, techniques and supervised. The difference here is unsupervised is we, we know nothing except the data. In the hypothesis driven area, we have the idea of the central limit theorem and normal distributions and Poisson distributions perhaps. Uh, machine uh, learning area, we don't have that. So these are, we're just looking at the data and we're trying to find out something about it. Now in, in the real world, uh, in, in most cases, we actually know something about the samples that we're analyzing. We might have good widgets and bad widgets. We might have uh, healthy tissue or cancerous tissue. And there's often something about the samples that we already know. So therefore it's useful then to be able to take that into account. In the supervised categories, they fall into various classes. So we've got a classification where we might want to separate two, two groups. And what, and what we're interested in there is not just the separation of them, but in some way of identifying which spectral features were responsible for those classes. So for example, if we had um, healthy tissue and diseased tissue, we might be interested in which chemical uh, features would be responsible for the diseased tissue, because that gives us biomarkers and helps lead towards drug discovery. We also have regression analysis for, for trends. Uh, we've just seen some work where we were looking at dissolution. Uh, and uh, we could also imagine other trends for do with time, concentration, pressure, disease state. So the, there are different uh, techniques for different cases. Here are some, uh, are some acronyms you may come across in the literature. Uh, PCA we'll look at at the moment. Um, canonical variance analysis is an extension of, of PCA, which takes into account some a priori knowledge, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, partial least squares covers regression, and, um, and that is useful for looking at for trend analysis. Canonical variance analysis can also be used for prediction, so that we can build a model and then we can take an unknown sample from that broad class of samples, for example, the, the the data we'll be looking at here is, is uh, bacteria. So we could take one, a bacterium and see whether it most likely lies with some other bacteria or not. And that helps us identify uh, um, a, a species that we may find. In the machine learning side, the equivalent of principal components would be k-means. And there is actually a, a middle ground where with certain parameterization, they both actually develop into the same technique. We have for classification, we might have support vector machines. That's useful for classifying things, but doesn't explain why things were classified into two groups. Random forests, and I put the trademark there because random forest name is actually, and the algorithm is actually trademarked, but it's open. Uh, and that is a, a method that we're using very much more in Manchester these days for analyzing trends and predictive models in, uh, in uh, our cancer research. So in this, uh, in this, the rest of this talk, we'll be talking about PCA, and then I'll have an ex one example of the canonical variance, just so you can see the difference. 
let's start with some terminology. Something I realized when I first started this is very difficult to work out what people mean in the literature and certainly in the um, in books and, and software about this sort of area because they're often coming from different backgrounds. The whole of uh, this area was developed through econometrics uh, and, and really science came into it relatively late. So an observation is anything that you could, that you take measurements of. It's an entity, it's a thing. And you can have multiple parameters that you might want to measure. So we, if, um, if we were analyzing cars, we might count how many wheels it has, what color it has, um, how many windscreen wipers it has. Um, a variable are those parameters and the, the values attached to those parameters. So if we're counting wheels, we might say a car has four wheels and some cars have three wheels. Uh, and vehicles might have two wheels if it's a bicycle. Um, and in chemometrics, we must measure, must remember to measure the same things. For example, it wouldn't make any sense if we're comparing a collection of cars, if we've measured the, how many wheels some of them had and how many doors other cars had and come to some conclusion about how fast the car could go. It really makes no sense. You have to measure the same things. So in spectroscopy, uh, an observation would be a spectrum and that has many data points and each data point is a variable and they're always in pairs so that we're measuring the wave numbers and absorption absorbance values for example for infrared spectroscopy our data layout that, we're, that we, we use for our algorithms we put spectra in rows and we have and therefore each column uh, corresponds to data points so here we can see that although we might normally join the dots as it were to form a, a continuous function that's not actually what we measure in the spectrometer. We're measuring data points, and that's what's in the file that we are opening. And each of these represents a separate measurement. In the old days, it was quite easy. Um, we had um, grating spectrometers in infrared, and, and we still have some grating spectrometers in, in Raman for good reason. And so therefore, if you set your grating position, you're, getting, you, you're taking a variable measurement, and they are not the same as any other grating position. Therefore, they're all independent. If we measure multiple spectra, um, we measure we need to measure things on the same grid. Therefore, we can't take we must have the same number of data points for, in each spectrum, and each data point must be representative of the same wave number in, for infrared, same wavelength, for example. And um, and that's important because otherwise, as we're, we're working with a matrix of data, we will end up with the wrong information in the wrong columns, and that's only going to cause problems. So sometimes for alignment. If you're getting data from different instruments, for example, it could be that the data would need to be interpolated before we could actually uh, continue on our work. And there's just another example. You can see that this data is, is lined up um, vertically one above the other. Now then, okay, so the first tricky thing. The first tricky thing is vector space. So this is, uh, when, we're, when we're working with our data, we don't work with lists of numbers, no, oh, well, I guess we do. We work lists of numbers, but we don't consider them as that. We consider them as vectors. So here are our data points. And this is for a single spectrum. So let's take uh, two of these uh, values, two wave numbers, and we're measuring the absorbance values in this infrared data. So what we do for this is going to form a two-dimensional space. We only have these two dimensions. And what we do now is because we have them, we can plot them one against the other. And that gives us a position, P, in this two-dimensional space. And P can be described by a vector. And this vector is the thing which we will use in the rest of the work. If we have another spectrum, we measure exactly the same wave numbers. We get two different absorbance values now. And then when we plot those into this vector space, we can see that what we have is two data points now, relatively close together because the spectra originally were relatively close together in their, in their form and function. So now we have two data points in n-dimensional space, both of which represent a spectrum. And this is two-dimensional space. Uh, the, the directions here, these vectors, lines that we have, the blue one and the orange one, we can see that the angle between them is quite small. And that is indicative of two spectra that are relatively similar. Likewise, these points at the end are relatively close together. And in Euclidean space, if we, that's another metric we can use for similarity, 
they're also close together, which gives us an idea that the data will be um, similar underlying. Now that we, we two two data points per spectrum is not very many when we are clear, clearly collecting hundreds or thousands of data points per spectrum, and each of those is corresponding to different chemistry. So therefore, we need more than more, more than uh, two dimensional space. So if we have two wave numbers, we have two dimensional space. Three wave numbers, we've got three dimensional space, and each of these is orthogonal. So we get the the uh, an orthogonal direction. Um, space. If we go to four dimensions, uh, we have four dimensional space. And the problem now is it's difficult to actually visualize. But the important thing to remember is that they're all orthogonal to one another. There is no component of momentum in a sense in, that is crossed over between these because they're all independent. In a spectrum, it's kind of difficult to picture that. But if you go back to a car analogy, they were counting the number of wheels is completely different to counting how many cylinders the engine has or how many um, what its top speed is. So these are all independent values. Okay, so now that you've got that under your, your belt, let's look at pre-processing because it's very important that we do some pre-processing in our data analysis. So this is pre-processing that you might normally do in all of the rest of your work. If you're in Raman, you would probably consider removing cosmic rays. You would probably also consider doing baseline removal. Any other instrumental features which are not pertinent to the to the um, the types of sample need to be corrected for uh, scattering phenomena, for example. And I believe that uh, Peter Gardner gave a presentation on scattering, me scattering uh, earlier in this series. Other things that you may wish to do are um, first or second derivative work. Um, and, and this is use, can be useful if we have um, overlapping peaks, which are gi giving rise to shoulders. And then some, in some other techniques, we may want to uh, do something to accommodate the dynamic range of the data, uh, and therefore square roots or log transforms or such that might come in useful. Uh, I would recommend against smoothing. I think smoothing makes your data look pretty, but it doesn't really help. It's uh, you, what you really do is you're masking the underlying information. So uh, I would never recommend smoothing data other than to uh, make a, an interesting graphic. It doesn't really help with the science, in my opinion. We can discuss that later. And then there's normalization. So normalization is quite an important parameter that we need to take into account. Uh, principal components analysis and most of these other uh, techniques that, that are out there in chemometrics uh, only measure or only taking into account a single um, thing that they're looking for in the data. So if our data is of different intensities for some reason, for example, if we're analyzing different thicknesses of samples, so we've got different absorbances, then uh, it would, that information will be confounded with this, the chemistry, and that's going to cause a problem. So we need to normalize our data, and there are different methods of normalization, which I've listed here, which will, and, and I'm only going to cover vector normalization. So here are our two data points. And we can describe those as vectors as we describe. And uh, if we take, um, if we define a vector length of one uh, and plot that as a, as a radius in this space, which admittedly doesn't look like a radius, that's because the, the x and y axes are different lengths on this plot, unfortunately. Then what we do is we, we uh, scale those and normalize that down so that we are um, falling on this curve. And that is effectively what we're doing in normalization. Here is some data. This is Roy's data of uh, UTI bacteria on uh, in, in using infrared. And we can see that the, the normalized data is very much more uh, controlled in a sense. It has, it's been brought into the same scale range. Uh, and, and that's what we would need to use for our data. Mean centering is important. So mean centering uh, brings our data into, into scope. Um, I'll give an example of mean centering here where we uh, we sum the columns of our matrix. So here, this is our, our before matrix, this is each spectrum. We, uh, we take the average of each column and we subtract the mean. And then we end up with a, the, the sum of these columns will then be zero. And this, where, where we have uh, a rise and fall, you can see that the red is, is relatively uniform compared to the blue. And this is accentuated somewhat. And that's useful because it helps the algorithm 
grab hold of the idea. So this is our data space. We, we are plotting a number of spectra uh, and here. So this, I think, is about 400 spectra. And we can see that um, we have a, a broad distribution at, at some various um, absorbance values. So this is absorbance of a particular band, and this is absorbance of a different band. And these are the intensities. And what we've done is we've subtracted the mean, and that's brought the axis into the middle. So before we were at the data was going from uh, broadly about 0.2 to about 0.7. And now we've centered our axes in the, in the middle of this space. This allows us to now spin these axes around the data rather than precessing. So the main deal, PCA. This was uh, invented quite some time ago now. Um, it was the, the underlying th uh, theory was um, done by Carl Pearson, and then it was uh, formalized better by Harold Hotelling in the 30s. So our underlying concepts here, what we're saying is our, our data has something in it that we are not able to measure, but that we are interested in. For example, we might be interested in uh, uh, how fast a car might go, and we might be measuring that by how expensive it is and how big the engine is. But that doesn't tell us we're not actually measuring its speed. We're inferring that from some other separate measurement. And then we also have to take into account that what we have is something that is useful to measure and then other spurious factors, which are partly noise and partly unwanted data that is also present in there. And as alluded to earlier, we also have a, a PCA can only manage a single source of variance, which means that if we are asking it to do too much at the same time, it will give you a, a, a combined answer, which would be difficult to interpret. So there are two common algorithms. The most common one that we come across these days is a single value, uh, singular value decomposition. It's a factorization. It's a matrix rotation. Uh, I'll discuss those in a moment. And it calculates all the principal components at the same time. The original um, approach back in the 1960s was uh, a partially squares approach where we fit a line through the data, we do a line of best fit, and then we subtract that, and they do another line of best fit. And each of these lines of best fit forms principal components. So factorization is something we need to take into account. So here's the, the number 12 as an example. We can factorize that in a number of different ways. So we can factorize by uh, it's 12 times one, two sixes, three fours, and the inverse of those. But those are not the only factors of 12. There are some other factors which are not integers. So there's one here. Then we've got some others, and we have a whole pile of these. And the problem is that there's an infinite number of these possible factors, which means there's an infinite number of rotations. And this is what um, Chris was alluding to when he was discussing MCR and that there's a rotational ambiguity that they call it. So question is, if you can spin these around forever, how do you know where to stop? In principal components analysis, what we do is we stop when uh, we have, so we are factorizing into three parts. We, we lock it on the components that are describing the most variance in the data in decreasing order. For MCR, the, the common, common approaches are to say that you can have no non-negative components and you can have no um, non-negative spectra. Those are two common, uh, common approaches for locking in this position. So what do we get out of PCA? PCA is just an algorithm. You type it in the computer, you say, please do it. Computer does it for you. You don't have to do it by hand. What we get is principal components, and each of these are orthogonal to one another because our data was originally plotted in orthogonal space. And we get pairs of information, generally speaking, and it's the pairs of information that we could keep together in, and assess in unison. It's quite important that we do that. The number of principal components we get is the minimum of the number of spectra and the number of variables. So if you have 20 spectra and 5,000 data points, you'll get 20 principal components. If you've got 20,000 spectra and 100 uh, wave numbers, you'll get 100 principal components. And that's because it's a covariance matrix that's underlying it. Our principal components are in decreasing order. So the first principal component holds the most information in the data, the second principal component, the next most, and so on. So how do we interpret this? 
So our loadings, uh, something that is highly loaded is where the principal component is close to one of the original axes of measurement. So in this case, the x-axis here, which, which I've, I've labeled here as the as wave number two, whatever that might be, the angle here is relatively small, which means that wave number two is important in describing that principal component. This wave number has a larger angle here, and that means that it's less important. Both of those wave numbers are present in the data, but one is more important in describing each this particular principal component. Other principal components would have different lines and therefore produce different angles. So here's an example from, uh, from uh, Roy's data. Uh, this is uh, a loading on, on principal component one, and we draw it as a line, but don't forget that actually it's just a load of different variables that are plotted next to each other. I'll describe how to interpret this later. This principal component is describing 65% of the variance in the data set. So that's reasonably high. Some other data sets, you can find that in the 80s and 90s straight away, because there's something that's very strong characteristic inside the data that is uh, locking the algorithm onto it. Second principal component looks different. The first principal component on the left, second principal component on the right. And we can see that there are the ba some bands are present in both positively and some both negatively, and then others are flipping between. So this is in the positive here, but it's in the negative in pre one. And that's important because that's saying that the weighting of those is different across the data. Uh, kind of running out of time. Uh, our scores, uh, our projections onto the this is how we measure the scores. The score is how far along the axis, uh, how far along our principal component, our data lay. And this is what our principal component scores would look like, and they're all the same color. And that's because principal component analysis has no knowledge of our underlying um, information that we have about these bacteria. Roy, of course, had all this information, which, which means that we can use them to color our, our data sets. And this, is, this would be useful for our interpretation. This is what happens if you don't vector normalize. That's with vector normalization, you can see that the green ones have come out isolated very nice, whereas without the vector normalization, it's much more of a mishmash. And that's because it's trying to hit the normalization and the chemical differences both at the same time. So normalization is important. Canonical variates I mentioned takes these points out of this quadrant onto a line, which means that this line is now describing the difference between the green and the rest of the colors, whereas here it was two different components were required for that, and that doesn't help. So interpretation, I'm going to speed up a little on interpretation. So we have the positive bands in principal component one are, uh, are expressed by all of these in the positive side of PC1 in the scores plot. So the green ones and some of these others, but perhaps not so much of the orange, are being well described by these features at say 1500 and at about three and a half thousand. Whereas these green ones are being described better by this feature here at about 1700 and this feature at about 3600. Likewise, the uh no just a minute i got that wrong no all of those have this in common and all of these have this in common principal component two is the other way around so principal component two negative is a good example of what these green ones are and not the purples the purple are at the top so this is telling you that these bands are more strongly weighted in these samples. And that's how you interpret that. That's uh, saying much the same thing. How do we know where we have signal, where we have noise? These, each principal component has amount of variance that it explains. And what we're doing is, so the first principal component has 65%. The second one has about 17%. And then we add these together until we get over 95. And that says, that uh, with now with six principal components, we're explaining about 95% of the variance in the data, and that's probably enough. Everything else after that is probably describing noise or is certainly less useful. Uh, 
experimental design, this comes back to taking things into account and you must randomize your data before you uh, reacquire it. If you acquire all of your untreated samples on one day and all your treated samples on another day, then you've introduced a confounding factor. So if they do separate, you don't know whether it's separating on the chemistry or if it's separating on the day of the week, instrument conditions, temperature, humidity, those things. So you should uh, come, uh, identify those things in advance. I'm going to skip over those because I'm out of date. And I'm going to leave you on the summary. Uh, plan your experiment. You need to plan to your confounding factors, how many samples you have, uh, and how many you're likely to need, how many spectra you're going to need, and randomize your data. You must pre-process, and you should also look at your, your percentage explained variance because it tells you at what point you have useful information and what point the, the information is lacking. In any data analysis, you should not remove any of your data without a good reason. That's p-hacking and that's cheating. And you're not supposed to do that, it's bad. Don't throw everything in. We say this a lot. Someone comes along, they can't understand the data. They say, here, look, at everything. Can you do a PCA on it, please? And they have different sampling conditions, different sample treatments acquired on different days by different people, put it all in the same place. PCA can't help you. You can only solve one question at a time. So you need simple questions and then you build on those. And if you have a priori knowledge, don't stop the principal component analysis, go on to the next stage, go on to any kind of discriminant analysis because that's where you need to be. And at the end, if you don't like the answer you're getting, go back and reassess the question because it could be that what you've done is you've asked too much of the, of the analysis and you should simplify what you've got. And with that, I'll end with just some uh, some, um, some words there from uh, some statisticians in the past, and uh, I'll hand back to uh, Ben and Joe, and thank you for listening.